Hi, Lockheed Martin here. Thank you for joining us live from our clean room here in Denver, Colorado, featuring OSIRIS-REx. We're taking our last look at the spacecraft before shipping to the Cape Canaveral to prep for launch on September 8th. If you have any questions about the OSIRIS-REx mission, please let us know. We will also be taking questions from our NASA social folks on the observation deck. Talk to you soon. So basically what the reaction wheels are is they are uh, inertial wheels uh, that allow us to uh, make small changes in the spacecraft attitude without having to burn propellant. Um, and so they are uh, literally just uh, mass that's on a very precision bearing. Uh, it spins up to a certain rate of speed to impart enough force to be able to, steer, to, be able to pitch the spacecraft in, in different orientations. Uh, it's mainly used for station keeping um, and for small maneuvers. Uh, the, the thrusters are what we use for the, for the larger burns, the larger man maneuvers. Very good. Anyone down there at the end? Kind of raise your hand and yell out to me and I'll re relay the question. We've got some questions going on down there. Let's share them with everybody down here. Okay, I'll ask a question. Chris, why are you wearing a white suit? All right. <laughs> so I like it. Tell me about the clean room. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, so, the so the suits that we're wearing down here, um, these are uh, fairly standard clean room garb um, that is uh, used for the, the Class 10K uh, clean room that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and uh, it's basically to, uh, it's mainly, you know, and you might look at it and it's like, well, it's, it's to keep the spacecraft clean, but really what, what the, the, the more uh, direct purpose of it is to keep the, all the dirt that comes with being human on the inside of the suit and not on the, out, not on the spacecraft that we're working on. Um, so the suits that we have on this one, uh, particular, uh, of course, they're head to toe here. Um, for this mission, uh, this is the only part. Of, this is the only exposed skin that we're that we have, um, and that's to that's to uh, eliminate the uh, the, the uh, potential for contamination either on the payloads or on the uh, the sample return capsule or the sample head itself, um, so that we don't end up sampling ourselves when the scientists uh, come back uh, come back and uh, go through the the return uh, for the return on the uh, uh, from the asteroid. Um, clean room itself, and, and I apologize, I can't remember if I went through this with this group or the previous group, uh, as far as the airflow on the, this, okay. Uh, so this one, uh, so this is a laminar flow uh, high bay. Um, that means if you look up, you'll see uh, vents on the ceiling. That's the output, uh, it's, it's uh, HEPA filtered air coming in from the ceiling, uh, being driven down to the ground. You see the vents along the ground, that's the take up air. And uh, it does two things, uh, it does two things to help control contamination, con or contamination. One is that any airborne particulates will be forced to the ground. Uh, the second is that uh, because we have a nice vertical laminar airflow, um, it should make it mu that much harder for a particle to migrate from one part of the high bay to the other. So any, uh, any contaminant that we have in, inside the high bay here should be localized to where it was generated so it's easier to clean up, to contain and clean up. We have a question down here from online. So what is Bennu? Okay, uh, so Bennu is an asteroid. And uh, uh, that we're going to go, that we're going to fly to. Um, it is one that is uh, is is an asteroid that is, that has an orbit that actually crosses over Earth's orbit. So it's one that we're that's of particular interest to us. Um, there's there's several asteroids in that class. Uh, but the, you know we talk about uh, the potential of a life exterminating event from a, from an asteroid. Uh, Bennu is one of those asteroids that has that potential um, given today. Not tomorrow. Not not next week. Uh, but sometime uh, down the road, um, these these class of asteroids could cross paths with Earth. Um, so it's so we all want to see uh, what they're made of, get the material, uh, understand uh, the materials, uh, so that we might be able to take action if uh, if in the future one of them does cross our path. So we got a question from our ten-year-old. For those of you just joining us, we're in the Osiris Rex clean room, learning about the O Rex mission. So um, how do you get the whole thing all the way down to Cape Canaveral to launch it? Like if you have to tie a balloon to it just to test it. <laughs> How do you get the whole thing all the way down to Florida without there being that many problems and without it breaking since it's so sensitive? Okay. Um, so, good, excellent question. Um, so, basically, when we're in our launch orientation, which is not much different from what you see here, um, this is made to survive launch loads. So, uh, the launch event itself is a very violent, shaking, uh, high G, high G event. 
um, much more so than anything that we could replicate uh, by moving it over either on the ro over the road or by air transport. So when the spacecraft is buttoned up um, in its launch orientation, it's fairly robust. Uh, where it's most fragile is when it's got uh, either the solar when it's got the solar array deployed, the solar arrays deployed, or the tag sam arm, the sample arm itself, um, out away from the spacecraft. And it's the the tag sam arm when it's out. It's, it is not built to support its own weight in 1G, so that's when we have to use the offload balloon. Uh, but otherwise, uh, it, once it's in launch orientation and all buttoned up, it's a fairly robust spacecraft. Um, the way we get it down to Florida is that we're going to, in a couple of days here, we're going to be bringing our shipping container in. Uh, we'll lift the spacecraft onto the shipping container, um, put a contamination cover over it, uh, put a lid over it, um, and then we'll put it on a truck and we're going to take it to uh, Buckley Air Force Base here in Aurora and then fly it via military C-17 to uh, the shuttle landing facility at KSC. Once we get there, we reverse the process, download from the aircraft, uh, put it on another truck to get to our processing facility, open the container once we're in the high bay there. Um, in the past, we've seen uh, it's a very smooth ride. Uh, we shouldn't see any events over about 1G uh, when, we, when we're going through that. So it should, it's going to get a nice, gentle ride as we go down there. We have a question from online, actually two questions. When will OSIRIS-REx be operational? And about how much does the spacecraft weigh? Okay, um, so the spacecraft, uh, I'll ask the, answer the second one first. Uh, spacecraft weighs, um, I believe it's about uh, uh, 1,700 uh, kilograms dry and I think 2,100 kilograms wet. Um, and, and unfortunately the best guy to answer that's sitting in the other window right now. Uh, the, uh, um, but the, and then uh, as far as when it's gonna be operational, so on day of launch, uh, September 8th, as soon as we get uh, initial acquisition on it, um, after it separates from the launch vehicle, uh, there's, a, there's a very short period, uh, just a matter of a week or two, where we check out the spacecraft initially to make sure that it's okay. Um, but it, it's operational at that point, and it's offline its mission. Um, so some other, some other programs, some other Earth, orbiter, uh, Earth orbiters, there's a more robust period of station of, uh, of uh, checkout once you get on orbit. Before you declare it operational, this spacecraft goes very quickly through that. So we do have another question online. Will the data come back to Earth to be studied? Yes, uh, so the, the, we'll fly the mission uh, right here out of, out of this building, and I believe you're headed there. I believe uh, the folks that are, that are here today will be uh, getting a tour of that shortly after this. Um, but the mission will be, flo will be flown here. Uh, the data comes back through the Deep Space Network, uh, gets piped over uh, the JPL network to this building, um, and then so the, t so the operators and the folks that are actually flying the spacecraft here in this building uh, will be looking at the, uh, not, real, not real time, but near real time uh, due, to, due to lights or due to uh, uh, one way light time and communication with the distance that the spacecraft's going to be away. Um, it'll come down as quickly as it can, and so that it'll be to their eyes um, as, quickly as, uh, as quickly as the system will carry it. Um, that data will be uh, here as we go, and then of course uh, once we get the sample and we return that to Earth here, um, that's going to head, uh, once we recover it, that goes to, uh, I believe it's uh, Johnson Space Center uh, for the, uh, the curation and the, and the, uh, and the uh, scientific uh, uh, work that they want to do on the sample when it returns. Great, we have a question up on the observation deck. contamination. How do you guys handle that? Does it happen often? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, yeah. no it, do, it doesn't happen often, uh, but it does happen. And uh, so the biggest thing that we do uh, here is uh, we adopt a clean as we go mentality. I mean, there are some operations that we do on the spacecraft that just by their nature uh, produce contamination. So we work to uh, to uh, mask off the areas uh, that we're, other than the area that we're working on, we'll use vacuums, we use uh, uh, IPA wipes um, and other things just to mitigate that as much as we can. And as soon as it's created, we capture it and, uh, and secure it, and then we clean the and then we clean the spacecraft after that. Okay, I got another question down here. So they tell um, riders they get riders block. Do they ever get any engineers block? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he, he's a rider, and, and often riders get what's called riders block. Do engineers get ever get engineers block? <laughs> I guess basically like. Dang! How are we going to solve this? Yeah, uh, I'm sure it happens. Uh, probably, probably more so to the, uh, the to the design folks uh, when they're sitting there dreaming these dreaming these spacecraft up. I would imagine they'd be a little bit more susceptible to it. Uh, down here we have uh, what we refer to as at low brain, which is kind of a loss of all space and time because we're so focused on what we're doing here. Um, you know, so that's so uh, that's probably the more common affliction that we have on the floor. We have a question that came in online. Can you tell us a little bit about your educational background, Chris? Okay. 
Um, so my, so uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, graduated with a bachelor's uh, in engineering, mechanical specialty from School of Mines uh, here in Colorado. Um, the, uh, uh, I came to, I lucked out really when I came into this industry. Uh, one of the first interviews I took was with the company here, uh, hit it off with the interviewer, and uh, this, is, this is what I wanted to do, so it really, it really couldn't have worked out more fortunately for me. Um, first mission I walked into was an interplanetary mission, and been doing them pretty much most of my career since then. So I want to know why everyone's wearing white suits, but a couple of the uh, head covers are different color. I see mostly white, but I see a blue and a gray. What is there a, is that color coding for some reason? <laughs> it is. It, it's color coding, and so we can keep track of folks. Uh, so uh, Ben here with the blue hood, with the blue hood. Uh, he's our uh, test conductor, so he's the guy in charge down here. Um, and then uh, Scott over here in our gray hood is our quality uh, quality personnel, so he's uh, he's the one keeping an eye on us. Uh, the rest of us in the white hoods are uh, are uh, the ones, uh, well, not me. These guys are the guys uh, doing the work and working on the spacecraft. <laughs> Question for the room. Right here, Presley. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit about um, the little penguin in a spacesuit? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so so the penguin um, is a mascot that we came up with a handful of months ago, um, and he's he's had some travels of his own here um, as we've gone as uh, we as uh, going out and visiting some of the various facilities that have uh, provided us uh, hardware. Um, he's a uh, you, know, you can't tell it right now, but in the, underneath the clean room suit, he's actually a penguin that's wearing a dinosaur suit for the tie-in to uh, um, Osiris Rex. Uh, he, uh, but uh, he's, got, he's got his own adventures, uh, but he's, uh, he's made, made the trip here today for this. So, <laughs> We have another question from online. Are there any 3D printed parts on the spacecraft? Excellent question, there are. Um, so uh, it's something that, we, uh, that we're, just, uh, we're just now starting to get into, um, getting them flight qualified for missions that have uh, environments that are as challenging as this one uh, is ta has taken a little bit of time. Uh, but we do have some parts on there. Um, they're harness support parts uh, that, have, that the, 3D, uh, the 3D printer was able to bake literally overnight and uh, get it to the spacecraft. So we do have that. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me ask the room if they've got any questions here. What do we think? Yeah, she just asked about that. That's all right. Okay, um, Gary's question. I see two big signs. One says Osiris Rex, one says Insight. Can you tell me some of the spacecraft that have been built in here over the years? Okay. Where is Insight? Uh, so Insight right now is uh, in storage, uh, waiting for uh, waiting for reactivation before it goes for its uh, next launch opportunity in 2018. It's actually uh, when you go into the uh, mission support area here, it'll be just below you. It's uh, in a room uh, back behind you here. Um, so it's in storage right now. Uh, this uh, this high bay originally was uh, built to support the Viking missions. Uh, so we've had Viking landers in here. We've had uh, um, Voyager propulsion systems in here. Uh, tethered satellite system was here. Um, let's see, uh, Magellan uh, came through here. Uh, let's see, and then uh, then we, the recent run uh, that we've had of interplanetary uh, missions, uh, starting with MGS, Mars Global Surveyor, uh, then Stardust, uh, the two uh, Mars 98 missions, Mars Climate Orbiter, uh, Mars Polar Lander, um, Mars Odyssey, um, Genesis, uh, then uh, moving on to uh, MRO, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, Phoenix, uh, which was a Mars lander, uh, Juno, which is uh, going into orbit around Jupiter, coming up here in July. Um, Grail, which went to the moon. Um, and then uh, Maven, which is a Mars orbiter that's uh, just arrived uh, last, uh, last year and a half at uh, Mars. And then uh, now InSight, which will launch in uh, 2018, which is a Mars lander. And uh, OSIRIS-REx going, going to the asteroid. Okay, we have a question from online. How is the spacecraft powered? Uh, so the spacecraft has, this is a solar powered spacecraft, uh, no nuclear source on this one. Um, so, and our, you can actually see our two, uh, uh, folks online unfortunately can't, but uh, we've got two, our two solar arrays off the vehicle um, covered over here. Um, the, the spacecraft has uh, two wings, one on each side as you might see in some of the pictures uh, online. Um, we have uh, lithium ion batteries um, that give, a, that, uh, that, uh, um, that provide the, the, bu the, the consistent bus power um, as, we go, as we go in and out of the sun um, during the mission. There's a um, covering on some of the instruments, um, at least I think they're blanketing. First of all, does the spacecraft look like this when it's in space or does it look a little different? And then what are the covers on the instrument? Why are they there? Okay, uh, so the covers on the instruments, um, I would assume uh, they should all have a, at least a bag on them. Um, they might have, they might have uh, some of the hard covers on top of them. 
Uh, those are there to protect the instruments uh, during ground processing and to help keep them clean. Uh, we only take the covers off when we have to or when we're actually working on the instrument or testing the instrument. Uh, the spacecraft itself is going to look uh, quite different uh, when we get to, uh, when, it, when it's on launch day. Um, the, the silver, uh, the silver uh, blanket that you see around the high gain, which is the, the prominent feature facing me, um, that's going to be basically what most of the spacecraft ends up looking like. It's going to be wrapped in that material. And then the two solar rays will be on. Uh, one will be facing you as, uh, in the viewing window there. The other one will be facing the wall over here. Um, so that will be sandwiching it on either side. Uh, but the spacecraft will be largely, uh, largely silver on launch day. You won't be able to see much of the detail that we have here at all. Where are the solar arrays? Uh, so the solar arrays are over here on this rack underneath the cover. Um, we're getting ready to install those uh, prior to shipment here in about two weeks. Uh, so we try to keep, they're very fragile, so we try to keep them off the spacecraft and out of harm's way as much as we can. There we go, one more question here. Uh, are there video cameras? Will we be able to watch some of this uh, while it's happening <laughs> from the from OSIRIS-REx? Um, so I, I, I don't know, actually, Gary, I'm going to throw that one back to you. I don't know what the plan is for the, the video. V video cameras on the spacecraft take in video of the mission. The answer is no. There are a lot of still cameras, okay. science cameras, and those will be processed and sent out to the public and mass, but no video cameras. Video is really large. Um, science instruments are a priority over cool video. Um, we'll definitely do video <laughs> in launch day. NASA.gov, man, so launch day, absolutely. <laughs> Let me, let me, let me add, um, Dante actually is going to correct One of our key products will be, we do, we do, they're basically still cameras, but during the tag event, we go to get the sample. We're moving slow enough. Even though we're only taking an image every second, we're going to be able to stitch together a video of that tag and the contact. So that'll be really, one of our key products. That's out. very cool. So I'm going to repeat that for our, our Periscope folks. What Dante Loretta, our PI, is actually up here. And, and said during the TAG event, which is the event where we actually go down and touch the asteroid and get the sample, we'll be using still cameras, but the event will happen so slowly that we'll be taking multiple, multiple, multiple images. It can actually create a little bit of a small movie showing that event. I can't wait till that day. That's going to be really cool. And the same thing when the, uh, when the TAG head actually goes into the sample return capsule. So we got one more question up here. Are we going to wrap up with you all? Yes. Thank you all for joining us on the Periscope for our look at the OSIRIS-REx mission in our clean room here in Denver, Colorado. The spacecraft will be launching September 8th from Cape Canaveral. Thanks again for joining, and make sure to follow Lockheed Martin's social handles to learn more about the mission.